Shall we pray? So let's do yeah. Yeah, perfect. I can hear you. Okay. and welcome. Hallelujah! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah! Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if we can have the slide. Keep moving on. Next one. Or back. There's a sense of expectation, just like for the disciples. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us new life and hope by raising Jesus from death. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen Wow, fantastic. Thank you. This is a wonderful day for us as Christians, isn't it? Where we remember that Jesus Christ died but is risen again. And we had a lovely um, service first thing this morning at the first light round the bonfire. 
remembering those women at the tomb, and we'll hear more about that later. But let's uh, begin today by singing that great hymn, Jesus Christ is Risen Today. Let's stand to sing, shall we? Well, we've had a great week being able to share something of the Easter story with some of the young people in our community. Um, we did uh, an Easter assembly down in Castle Court School, and then this week, at the beginning of the week, we had Henbury View School come into church and learn about the, um, the story. And then their whole school and all the parents came on Wednesday for an Easter service. So we've really been celebrating Easter this past week. But the thing I um, really love with doing things with children is they always have such great, great questions. And at the end of um, our time with Henbury School, when they had learned all about the different aspects of this, the story of Holy Week, um, I was brave enough to say, well, I wasn't brave enough to do it on my own. I said, come on, team, you come with me. and They can ask us any question they want. And um, so the others came up. And one boy asked us this question, which I thought was just such a great question. He said, if you could be any character in the Easter story, who would you be? So I'm going to ask uh, Evie, Rachel, Charles, who were all on the stage with me, to come. And they can all share their answers to that question. So I'll go first because I'm here, but if you guys come up. So I said, well, I would like to be the, uh, the woman who went to the tomb and found it was empty because I would be so, so excited and be, just think it was wonderful that I was the one that got to tell everybody that Jesus was risen. So that was my answer. Evie, what was your answer? I said I would want to be the donkey on Palm Sunday. <laughs> Which you're all laughing, but I just thought it'd be great to see the party and everybody's so excited, but I didn't want the pressure of being Jesus himself, so I thought the donkey was a good, a good place to be. <laughs> I just wanted to 
Each one of those disciples racing to the tomb. You know, there's that first sort of sign. Maybe something has changed. You know, maybe, maybe Mary's onto something here. And actually in that race of anticipation and expectancy to get to the tomb and to peer inside. I think that would be a life-changing moment. And I decided I would want to be the angel who was kicking back in the tomb, just waiting to see who it was going to be that turned up first that I was going to get to tell that exciting news to. So that's who I'd be. Great. Anybody got a different answer they want to share with us? Anybody would have chosen something else? Somebody else? Nobody else wants to share. Oh, Anne, who would you have been? I would have chosen to be Mary, his mother, and to be delighted that he had risen and hadn't, wasn't really dead. Because yeah. even though I believe the story, I would think that would be really significant yeah. for me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very personal one, yeah. Mother's heart. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Well, the wonderful thing about Easter is we just, as somebody shared at our early morning service, I think somebody prayed this, that it just brings us back to the heart of our faith, that Jesus died on the cross. He went through so much so that we might be forgiven. And so it's just an opportunity now for us to come again to the Lord and confess our sins and receive forgiveness. So let's just have a moment um, just to be with God and offer him those things that we know we want to say sorry for this morning. So God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we confess our sins to almighty God. And if you join in the words in bold. Like Mary at the empty tomb, we fail to grasp the wonder of your presence. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Like the disciples behind locked doors, we are afraid to be seen as your followers. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Like Thomas in the upper room, we are slow to believe. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And so may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in him, his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we say together, God of glory, by the raising of your Son, you have broken the chains of death and hell. Fill your church with faith and hope. For a new day has dawned, and the way to life stands open in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, I think there's an opportunity for our children to go out with Evie if they would like to. And um, I think Easter eggs might even feature with Evie. <laughs> There she goes. It's like the Pied Piper, isn't it? I'm leaving now. <laughs> well done. We're going to have our first reading this morning that Anthony is going to come and read. Chapter 10, verses 34 to 43. Then Peter began to speak. 
I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And they killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of the Lord. Our band are going to lead us now as we worship together. Happy day, the greatest day in history. If you'd like to stand, please do. One, two, three, four.
Christ who died and rose again. Let's just take a moment where we just reflect on what that name of Jesus means for us today. Jesus, thank you that your name is a name that is higher than all names and that every tongue will one day confess that you are Lord. And today, Lord, whatever we're holding, whatever is before us, we declare that your name is the powerful name and that you are Lord over all of our lives. Hallelujah. Amen. Do have a seat, and we're going to read again that wonderful story of the first Easter from Luke's, uh, from John's Gospel. John chapter 20. Turn the pages. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped round the head of Jesus. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. 
Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I'll get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had, what he had said, these things, these things to her. This is the Gospel of Christ. Many years ago, uh, long before we were ordained, Jane and I were in a church and um, it was growing, lots of young families coming in. And we thought the church decided to consolidate the church and get to know one another better. We would uh, have a barbecue in a park uh, together with a game of rounders. And so everybody convened, loads of people came. It was fantastic, nice day. And, you know, the deal was, because there was lots of kids there, when you got into bat, you, you gave a little tap and, you know, the child caught it and then they came in and so on. Well, everything went well until the vicar got into bat. And when he got in, the first, it was a little child, I remember a six-year-old child delivering the ball, smashed it out of the park. <laughs> Everybody sort of politely applauded, but slightly shocked. Anyway, that meant, you know, he didn't have to run because you get three balls, so the child bowls, um, bowls it again. And again, this time, smashes it out of the park. And at that point, everybody, you know, it's beginning to get a bit embarrassing. Someone hasn't read the script here. And uh, my son Sam is smiling, because I think you must remember this. And... Um, the third ball, again, smashed it out the park. Well, there's a deathly silence across the sort of church members. And it's made even worse because he then sort of does a sort of 400-meter sprint around all the bases, knocking over all the children to make sure he got round. Anyway, bless him. He was a fantastic vicar. He genuinely was, and the church grew and so on. But he had this incredibly competitive streak and it didn't matter, even in that context, you know, he couldn't suppress that. He couldn't sort of hold it down. It was actually always going to be there. And I wonder if in our reading this morning, you pick that up as well. Um, here's John describing how he and Peter raced to the tomb on this first Easter morning. And John is so self-effacing, he doesn't even refer to himself by name. He just calls himself the other disciple. But he is clearly deeply, deeply competitive. Human history is about to change here, but he wants us to know that he won the race. He overtook Peter and he got there first. And just in case that you forgot it first time round, did you notice a few verses later in verse 8, he repeats it. Then the disciple who reached the tomb first, also went in. <laughs> and I would suggest 
that it's these very, very authentic human emotions and complexities and foibles that come across on this Easter morning. I mean, put yourself for a moment in the shoes of Mary Magdalene as she made her way to the tomb. What could she have been imagining? This man Jesus, this incredible teacher, her dearest friend, was dead. The one who had shown her, and indeed all the other disciples, what God was really like is gone. And we can imagine her anguish. Hope had evaporated, but also the questions she must have had. What on earth were the last three years about? Why couldn't God, his Father, save him? These opening words to the passage early in the morning while it was still dark. Somehow, they capture this sense of lonely solitude and grief. There's a famous passage in the Old Testament where the prophet Elijah is completely and totally emotionally exhausted. He's terrified for his life, and God feels a million miles away. And he finds a cave in the middle of nowhere, and this huge drama plays out around him. There's an earthquake, there's a hurricane, there's a blazing fire, the rocks are ripped apart, and yet the Bible says that God didn't speak in any of those things. But rather, Elijah hears a still, small voice. And it's by way of a question. What are you doing here, Elijah? And there is such a resonance between that story and the story of this first Easter and Mary in the garden, because she would have been part of the drama of Palm Sunday and those joyful crowds shouting, Hosanna. And then Maundy Thursday and the terrible anguish and the tensions around Gethsemane and Jesus' arrest. And then the events of Good Friday and the trial of Jesus and the angry mob shouting, crucify him. She would have all that in mind. And it's from this dramatic backdrop that John brings us right the way back to the stillness, the silence, and the darkness of that early morning. And a grieving woman who thinks she is talking to a gardener. And yet it's in that moment that Jesus speaks to Mary, and like Elijah, he asks a question. Who are you looking for? And again, as with Elijah, he calls her by name, Mary. And of course, it's in that moment that she recognizes him. And I think that John is saying to us that it's when things are most difficult maybe even those black moments in our lives, we can struggle to hear God. We can struggle to see how he is working. He can feel a long way off. And yet, and yet, John says, he is closer than we can ever imagine. Because, of course, the gardener is Jesus. But I think John is also making the point, isn't he, that it's, it's God who reaches out. He is the one who takes the initiative. He is the one that begins the conversation. Two weeks ago, I heard a lovely story relating to the Wycliffe Bible translators. They're based in Oxford. Um, Derek, uh, Derek Cheeseman, our own Derek, used to work for them, or still does work for them. Um, and... Um, some, t- some years ago, they were working uh, with the Cameroon people in West Africa and translating the Bible into their local language. And the local people formed a translation committee. And it was a deeply patriarchal society, so this committee was all men. Um, and then there was a Wycliffe Bible translator. And he was asking this committee about the verb, their verb, to love. To love. And it's spelt DV their verb, um, to love. But the thing is, in, in, the, in the Cameroonian language, or in that particular dialect, every verb, 
whatever it was, whether it was, you know, to eat, to drink, to play, to wear, whatever verb it was, it ended with one of three letters, I, A, or U. And depending on whether it ended with I, A, or U, it meant something slightly different. So the translator was asking the committee, okay, so let me give you an example. He said, if I, you know, would it be possible um, to say um, uh, that I dev my wife? In other words, D-V-I, the top one there, my wife. And they replied, well, that would mean she would be loved providing she remained faithful and cared for her husband well. So the translator said, well, could you devour your wife? Um, and they said, well, actually, um, that would mean that she was loved, but now that love had gone. And then they said, well, or well, the translator asked this committee, well, could you devu your wife, the bottom one? And at that point, everybody fell about laughing and said, well, of course not. It's a ridiculous question. Because that would mean you would have to keep loving your wife no matter what she did. Even if she never got you water, even if she never made you meals, and even if she committed adultery, you would be compelled to keep having to love her. What a crazy idea. No, the word doesn't exist. Well, it was a patriarchal society. And then the Bible translator remembered that verse in the Gospel of John just a few chapters earlier. And it points all the way back to Good Friday, which said that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not be lost, but have eternal life. And he turned to the translation committee and he asked them, could God devu your people? Apparently there was complete silence for three or four minutes. You can read the story yourself on their website. And then tears began to flow down their face, their faces. And the leader said, you know what this would mean? It would mean that God kept on loving us over and over again, millennia after millennia, even when we repeatedly rejected his love, even when we've, we've disobeyed him more than any other people. This is the God of Easter. This is the God of amazing grace who reached out to Elijah, who reached out to Mary, and who reaches out to us today, the God who takes the initiative, who knows, who knows us better than we know ourselves, and who accepts us with all our conflictions and with all our struggles. In fact, the God who himself became human and understands our humanity. And in this passage, John doesn't shy away from or hide these inner tensions. Notice even in the moment when Peter and John discover the empty tomb in verse 9, John writes this, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. They've been with him for three years and they still struggle to get it. And don't forget, these were the men who had disowned Jesus, who'd run away just a couple of days before. I wonder where you are on your Christian journey. This passage says that if you wrestle with your faith, if at times you struggle to understand, if at times you are only too aware of your inner conflictions, those tensions, your baggage, then you are in good company. Because Easter Day doesn't really speak to those of us who've got it all sorted. And my hunch is that if we went round this congregation this morning, including those who are joining us online, and if we shared with absolute honesty with one another, the thing that we would definitely not find, we wouldn't find, is a church of people who never fail, who don't carry disappointments in life, who know nothing of regret, 
who never struggle at times in their faith, nor have any doubts. My hunch is that most of us, if not all of us, have no problem thinking of what to bring before God when we have that time of confession each Sunday as we did earlier today. Easter and the empty tomb do something else. They point us to the words of Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, when he talks of a saviour who was wounded for our wrongdoing, who was crushed for our iniquity, that it's through his death we receive healing. Easter speaks of a saviour who said, come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Easter says to those of us who are only too aware of our failings and our shame, I am a God of mercy, and without condemnation, I reach out to you. But there's something else here, because the empty tomb also says that suffering and death have met their match. I mean, we've just sung the words, the empty cross, the empty grave, life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive. And these are not just sort of feel-good sentiments, but they are profound truths Because Easter speaks of a road to a new life that cannot be blocked by death. That evil and suffering will not triumph. And we can live in confidence without fear and full of hope. In fact, I believe that more than ever in this secular and confused and torn world, God calls Christians to be people that radiate hope in every part of our life, in what we speak out, in how we live, the things that are most important to us, our priorities. Last year, a well-known Christian banker and philanthropist, Jeremy Marshall, based in London, he died at the age of 60 after a long illness. And he wrote a book about his experience of living with cancer. And he used this period in his life of illness to testify to God's goodness and faithfulness. And he spoke to many churches and businesses and schools and students. There was one CEO of a a very well-known charity who knew him well and said that Jeremy achieved much more in his 10 years of illness than most of us do in our entire lives. And when he first uh, was made aware of this illness, he was interviewed about the moment he had to break the news to his family, his wife and his children that he had inoperable cancer. And he spoke about his faith in the God of Easter and how that God had sustained him. But at the end of the interviewer, he was asked, is there any final thing that you want to say? And he simply replied in six words, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Because Easter may not shield us from the ups and downs of life, but it takes all of these things and it offers us a hope that transcends them. Easter declares that our lives have meaning and purpose. And that ultimately, ultimately, all will be well. And it requires faith, doesn't it, sometimes, to believe that all will ultimately be well. But we are an Easter people, a people of faith. And we're going to declare our faith in the risen Lord today. No matter how we feel, no matter what's going on, as we look around the world and we look in our own lives and hearts, we want to declare our faith in God. So let's stand together and I'm going to ask you these creedal questions and respond if you would like to. 
Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you sit, and in just a moment, we're going to have our intercessions, our prayers for today. But I just want to share some updates on things that we've been praying about. And uh, Jan and Richard have asked me to share the latest news about Thomas. And that is that he is still very um, poorly in the intensive care unit. And progress is slow. And so we, uh, we just ask for your continued prayers for Thomas and of course all the family as they continue to watch and pray in these days. And I know it means so much to Richard and Jan that as a church family we're standing with them. They know we're with them and that we are praying so much for them. And I know that you all are. Um, so we're just going to keep on praying and some of you will know that for the past 18 months or so, we've also been standing with Emma Marie. Many of you will know Emma Marie from um, playing her violin, but uh, not all of you will know her story. And I, I'm not going to share all of her story right now, but um, most of you will know that she had to flee Russia during uh, when the war started um, with Ukraine because she was playing in a Russian orchestra at the time. And uh, her and her husband um, came to, to England. Emma Marie comes from um, this area. Came for her, it was coming back. But her husband is not English. And um, he... Uh, was not able to stay permanently in the country because of his nationality. And for 18 months, we've been praying when it hasn't looked good for him and that they may have to, to leave and not be allowed to stay. And it's been a long and difficult and hard journey. And it's been a roller coaster of a journey for them as we have prayed with them. But we had the news just a couple of days ago that the Home Office have now said that her husband is going to be able to stay in the country. And so we're really praising the Lord and seeing a, a real huge answer to prayer there. And I can see some big smiles around for those who have been praying there. So prayer works and God works in mysterious ways and sometimes we don't understand, but we know ultimately, as Charles said, all will be well. And I know Carol is watching us live at home um, today and we're standing with Carol as well as she goes through difficult times. So let's keep praying for each other. And now Tim's going to lead us in our prayers this morning. As we celebrate the new life of resurrection, let us pray to the one true God who brings us all to life. The response to Lord of life in your mercy is hear our prayer. Lord of life in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church on this most joyous day, internationally, nationally, and locally. 
for our diocesan Sudan Link and for Archbishop Samuel and the huge role he and the church play in the South Sudan. For our Archbishop Justin and Easter celebrations taking place throughout the country. For our bishops Stephen and Karen, our archdeacons and the deanery team. And here in our church in Corfmullen, for Jane and Charles, our new curate David and his family, for our church wardens Alison and Neil, and those that work in the office, for Karen and Tracy, and all those that serve on the PCC. And Lord, we also pray for our forthcoming APCM and the Bible course on Romans next month. May this joy of Easter refresh and invigorate all those who serve you, Lord. Lord of life, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <clears throat> we pray for the world. As we reflect on new life, help us all to be mindful of the role each one of us plays in protecting the natural resources you have given us. Each day, may we be resourceful, not wasteful, considerate in the way we purchase and consume and dispose those resources. And we pray for all the organizations working to educate and save and protect our planet. We pray for all those in position of authority. There are so many desperate situations throughout the world, Lord. You know each and every one of them. Grant world leaders wisdom and integrity courage to do the right thing, and may they and those around them be guided by your word. And we pray for our King, King Charles, and his family as they celebrate this special day, publicly and privately. And especially we pray for healing for the King and other members of the royal family at this time. Lord of life, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our community, especially this holiday period, and for the whole outreach mission of our church's place here in the village of Corfmullen. For our holiday club later this year, our involvement and witness at the Corfmullen Carnival, the work of the food bank, the community lunch, the co coffee at St. Nicholas on a Saturday morning, the pastoral visiting team, the Compass Bereavement Group, Tots, tea and toast, wild church, and especially our new service of Rise. We give thanks to all those that volunteer and give their time and energy. And we pray, Lord, that your message of love, good news, and new life may be seen by all those we encounter through our outreach into the community. Lord of life, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, Lord, we pray for those who suffer and are in need. Lord, the media is full of news of a broken world, a world at war, of violence, persecution, exploita exploitation, famine, dire poverty, injustices, abuse, hatred, distrust, anger, confusion. Things that are difficult for us to hear and are heavy on our hearts. But as believers, as we arrive to this joyous Easter day, we remember that we are a people of hope, a hope in you. Help us to faithfully trust in that hope and that you are at work amidst the turmoil and pain. And also, Lord, we pray for those who are unwell at this time, in hospital or at home, those with health worries, those who are lonely, isolated, those with financial concerns or who live in fear and anxiety. And in a moment's silence, we call to mind those known to us and who are on our hearts. We pray for healing and resolution. Be with them, bring them comfort and peace, and be with those who care for them, 
and all the organizations locally, nationally, and internationally that work to support them. This Easter day, Lord, we remember that in you all things are possible and your promise of eternal life. In that true hope, we entrust all these people and situations to you. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you stand for the peace? The risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then they were glad when they saw the Lord. Hallelujah. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's share a sign of peace with one another. Peace of the Lord be with you. 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 The Lord be with you. And him, end of him. Think our children can come on back in if they will, if they're ready. And we're going to sing, I cast my mind to Calvary. again.
Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Because through him you have given us eternal life and delivered us from the bondage of sin and the fear of death into the glorious liberty of the children of God. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, Send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voices to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Lord, our hearts hunger for you. Give us this bread always. Hallelujah, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Hallelujah.
together God of life who for our redemption 
gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross and by his glorious resurrection have delivered us from the power of our enemy. Grant us so to die daily to sin that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his risen life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Before we sing our final hymn, I'm just going to invite Kate to come forward, who'd just like to share with us something from her work in the hospital as a chaplain at the hospital. So Kate, come on up. Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. Um, I wanted to share with you an experience that I had visiting someone this week um, on Good Friday. Um, as a hospital chaplain in various hospitals uh, around locally, um, when somebody reaches a point in their lives where treatment is no longer going to be given, um, the chaplains are always called and we will go and visit that person and sometimes we'll just make cups of tea for the family who are with that person or sometimes um, we might listen to people share their stories of their life and their experiences and sometimes it's a little bit different to that. I arrived on the, on the ward on Good Friday and um, one of the members of staff said, oh, could you go and see this lady? Um, and I was a little bit surprised because she'd said before to us, oh, not really religious, lovely to see you, thank you very much. And so I went to see her and she said, I wasn't sure who to talk to, but I really needed to tell someone about this. And she said, I've had a dream, and I had a dream, and in it I couldn't see God, but I heard God speak to me. I know it was God. I can't tell you how I know, but I know it was God. And my family think I'm nuts, but I know it was God, and it wasn't the drugs. And so I nodded reassuringly, and she continued. In my dream, that voice, that voice of God said to me, it, sa it said, he said, um, you're not going to die now, this minute, but you will be coming soon. I want to tell you that I'm making a place for you. And when it is time, I'm going to come and I'm going to get you and I'm going to bring you to be with me. She is a lady who hasn't been in the church. She hasn't worshipped she just heard those voices that you, that voice saying, as you might recognize from scripture, I go to make a place for you and I come to get you the voice of Jesus as he speaks to his disciples before he goes to the cross. It's just the most amazing testimony that I have heard in my work and I wanted to share it with you. But particularly what she said to me afterwards, she said, though my family think I'm nuts, they can see that I'm no longer afraid. And she said, and it's more than that. I have no fear. And then she searched for a word and she said, what I really feel now is that I'm acceptable to God. It's amazing. That God that uh, Charles was talking to us about in the Cameroon is still alive and working through his spirit even in our area. Praise him. Happy Easter, everyone. What a wonderful way to close our service, isn't it? A wonderful story of God at work now, here, today. Let's Give him the glory as we sing together. Thine be the glory. Let's stand.
So may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, make us perfect in every good work to do his will, working in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and all those whom you love and pray for this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to celebrate with popping some corks next door. We've made it easy. It is all non-alcoholic, but the symbolism is there. We're celebrating. There's cake. There's uh, tea and coffee as normal. But do stay and enjoy the celebration together.